Hello, and welcome to spectroscopy. Who are spectroscopists? I think that the first spectroscopists were likely astronomers. If you think about it, spectroscopy is a way to investigate molecular structure without actually having to touch or interfere with the molecule, for the most part. And if you're trying to figure out the chemistry of gas clouds in space or other planets, or the surface of the sun, spectroscopy is the way to do it. The first observations of spectroscopy were likely the absorption lines in the solar spectrum. Here we see a quote from Maxwell, the famous physicist, on the importance of spectroscopy and celebrating its contributions to science and, of course, mentioning specifically um, astronomy and uh, uh, the universe uh, as he sort of salutes the, the field. So spectroscopy is going to use light, or really electromagnetic radiation, and of course, a little aside to smashing molecules to bits, in order to understand molecular structure and determine the molecular structures of molecules that we cannot see. You can't see the molecules in a test tube any more than you can see the molecules on the surface of Saturn. But with spectroscopy, you can actually get the structures of both. So let's consider the electromagnetic spectrum. Of course, it's a very wide range of energies. But there's some famous regions that we're very familiar with. Of course, visible light would be one of them. We're very familiar with visible light and using visible light to investigate uh, a certainly atomic structure. The absorption spectra of hydrogen and helium are famous signatures of elements in, say, the solar corona. Um, now, visible light can be used, but also ultraviolet light just past visible, um, which is responsible for exciting uh, electrons in molecular orbitals of molecules, and so we can gain information about the electronic structure of molecules with visible and UV light. Infrared light is in the range of energy where we see bond vibrations. So you can imagine that infrared light would tell us a lot about bond vibrations. And of course, bond vibrations will be characteristic of the two atoms that are connected to each other and the nature of the bond between them. And really, two atoms and the bond between them describe a functional group. A carbonyl is different than an oxygen or an alcohol. So IR can tell us a lot about the functional groups in a molecule. And of course, the details of IR can tell us a lot about the structure of a molecule as well. But as organic chemists, we're going to find ourselves focusing a lot on the radio spectrum because that is where quantum transitions inside the nuclei of atoms can be found. And we can look at the exact environment of every proton and every carbon in a molecule and also how they are connected together. And if we know their environments and we know the order in which they're connected together, we can tell a lot about the structure of a molecule. So nuclear magnetic resonance is really the bed and bread and butter of organic chemical structure elucidation. And more than half of this course will be spent on nuclear magnetic resonance topics. So let's look at sort of the first uh, uh, way that we might explore a structure, and that would be with UV visible light. So there's our three bands that we're going to use, and plus we're also going to use a hammer as well, and we'll see in a second. UV visible light can tell us a lot about electronic structure. Here's two molecules that you'll see uh, in these two molecules. Anyway, here's two molecules, and the absorbance spectrum has a shift in the wavelength in which the peak occurs. And this shift has a lot to do with the energy transitions between molecular orbitals. So you can see one pi system is longer than the other pi system. And when you get these long pi systems, the pi orbitals are all stacked on each other, and they get closer together the more you lengthen the number of pi systems. And of course, if they're closer together, that's less energy to promote an electron from one to another and requires a lower wavelength, a shorter or longer wavelength of light. So here we see that molecule B requires a longer wavelength of light to do the same work that molecule A uh, is experiencing. So a conjugated structure will tend to push these electron transitions up into the UV and then into the visible. And if you have really long conjugated systems, like in beta carotene, you're well up in the visible and you actually have colors. Like for example, beta carotene colors carrots orange. Having said that, UV and visible light is not too useful for determining the details of structure. And so we'll give it a fairly short overview in this course, but um, mostly it is more useful for determining concentrations and, uh, and uh, analyzing systems that we are already familiar with the structure. Um, but uh, it can certainly tell you a lot about pi systems in a molecule. Infrared is very useful. 
infrared tells us a lot about specific stretching frequencies in a molecule. So here we see peaks and they're all correlated with particular CH stretching frequencies. On the left, we see the alkyne CH stretch quite characteristically out there well past 3000 wave numbers. And there around 3000, we see the CH stretch there just in from the left. And that's your typical alkane CHs. And we see that, we know we just basically have CHs attached to carbons. The specific frequencies can tell us if we have an alkyne or an alkene. Then over on the right, we see the bending frequency for the CH. And that's a pretty floppy bend, and it happens down at much longer wavelengths um, because it's easy to do. It doesn't require as much energy to promote um, uh, to the next vibrational energy level uh, for that particular transition. Um, there's the CC stretch in the alkyne, very characteristically showing up there around 2100 wave numbers. So all of these um, are characteristic of functional groups. The stretching and bending frequencies can tell us a lot about a molecule's functional groups and in some cases its actual arrangement. Now if you can imagine stretching vibrations are a little tougher to achieve than bending vibrations. So stretching vibrations happen at higher frequencies and bending vibrations tend to happen at lower frequencies for the same set of atoms. Now infrared can tell us a lot about functional groups. Nuclear magnetic resonance can do the same. It can also tell us how many particular atoms um, are, exist in a molecule, especially for protons, and it can tell us exactly how they're connected together in many cases. So here we see a simple molecule. So there it is. Um, and the tertiary butyl group that you see there has that strong peak there around one part per million on the x-axis. And what you're seeing there is a signal from the protons, a radio signal from the protons. And it's at that particular location because these protons are in a magnetic field. Nuclear magnetic resonance implies a strong magnetic field and then measures the radio frequency emissions from quantum transitions within the nucleus. And here we see uh, these molecules are actually experiencing uh, not as much magnetic field as, or sorry, these protons are experiencing not as much of a magnetic field as those two higher peaks. And why? Because they're what we call shielded. Um, they have lots of electrons around them, and that basically hides them to some extent from the magnetic field. Now, if they are perhaps close to an electron withdrawing group, like that carbonyl, we're going to see that they'll have less electrons around them, or less electron density, and they feel a little more of the magnetic field that they are within. As a result, we call them deshielded, and, and their signal comes out a little higher. Well, as you can imagine, functional groups are going to have a big impact on this shielding, and we will be able to see across the scale from 0 all the way up to 10 and sometimes even 12, we'll be able to see signals that are characteristic of protons adjacent to or part of various functional groups. And we can also tell how much there are of them. We can see from the integration here, that red line, we can see that there's two protons in one particular magnetic environment, three protons in another particular magnetic environment, and then of course with the tertiary brutal group, nine protons in yet another. What this spectrum tells us, because all of these molecules are separated, um, they're not adjacent, none of these protons are adjacent to each other. They're all separated by a, a carbon that has no protons on them. So there's no information about connectivity in this particular NMR. I chose it because it was simple. But this simple NMR tells us that we have three separate groups of protons. Two, three, and nine protons in each group. That's all it tells us. With that information alone, and perhaps knowing there's a carbonyl there, which you could get from the IR, you would draw this structure. I'm sure you would. So even at its most basic level, knowing nothing about uh, how nuclear magnetic resonance works, you could just take the fact that there's three different protons here and a carbonyl group, and you would end up inevitably drawing that molecule. So nuclear magnetic resonance can tell us far more than this. Uh, and we can get nuclear magnetic resonance for all those carbon atoms too. And even um, nitrogens and lots of other atoms you can have specific uh, NMR spectra for. And you can get a lot of information about how carbons are connected to protons, how protons are adjacent to other protons, how nitrogens are connected to protons, and you can pretty much determine the connectivity through even a large organic molecule with NMR. You can have a one-dimensional spectrum like this, and at NMR you can have two-dimensional and three-dimensional techniques where you're changing parameters on more than one axis. Um, and as a result, you can get quite a lot of information about how things are connected together. We're only going to scratch the surface of NMR, even though most of our course will be focused on NMR. Uh, but it is an incredibly powerful technique, and I hope that you'll be along for the ride. Mass spectra are not really, it's not really spectroscopy. It's not using the electromagnetic spectrum. It's the idea of 
impacting a molecule in the gas phase with an electron beam or some other high energy uh, molecule, like a, a small molecule like ammonia, knocking an electron out or charging it, creating a charge in some way, adding a proton. In some way, we are making an electrically charged molecule. And then in the presence of a magnetic field, uh, we can measure its mass. So here we are. We're able to get the mass of a molecule here. Um, and if we know its exact mass, then um, basically we know its empirical formula, or it's actually its molecular formula. And we can see that down there on the right, its mass is 112.052 and more decimal points atomic mass units. Only the formula C6H8O2 fits that exact mass. Um, we can also, with the low resolution mass spec up on your left there, we can tell from the fragments what's smashing off in the gas phase. Once you've impacted it with a high energy electron, that energy can't escape from that molecule because it's in the gas phase. It's not bumping into other molecules to pass that energy on. And as a result, it may fragment. Some molecules fragment far more easily than others. This molecule seems fairly robust in that you can see a lot of the complete molecule impacting the detector. Um, but then there are some fragments. And so mass spec can tell us the mass of our molecule, which, you know, that's one of the most important things we need to know. What's the mass of it? From the mass, you can propose formulas that fit the mass. And then from the fragments, you can actually see sections of it and know that there's a carbonyl group, or likely a carbonyl group, because you can see the CO group coming off. Um, and you can see the ethylene group come off. And you can follow fragments of it. So mass spectrometry is very powerful. And you can even do mass spec of mass spec. You can collect a particular mass of fragment in your mass spectrometer in a trap and then do mass spec on it and further fragment it and you can get fragments of the fragments. And you can do mass spec of mass spec of mass spec. So much like the two-dimensional and three-dimensional techniques in NMR, mass spec has these sort of two-dimensional and three-dimensional methods and you can actually unambiguously identify molecules. And this is how they catch Olympic athletes with their steroids. These exact masses, once you know the mass of the molecule, and the mass of all the fragments and how they break up. Um, and then you collect a particular characteristic fragment of, say, that steroid that's involved, and then fragment that further to prove that it is that fragment. You can basically say, we know what you did, and take away their metal. And that's what mass spec can do. Mass spec can really accurately identify molecules, especially molecules that are already known. And it can tell us the mass of molecules that are unknown. Uh, and in many cases, uh, through database methods, tell us whether or not that molecule has ever been discovered before. So if you're doing drug discovery, analyzing natural products, uh, accessing a mass spec database will quickly tell you whether that molecule that you're interested in is owned by someone or whether it's yours. And if it's yours, go with it. So these are the three techniques that we can use. Radio techniques, and that's nuclear magnetic resonance, and that's going to be most of this course. Infrared techniques, and that's following bond stretching energies, and that's going to be one of the first topics we cover in this course. Very useful. We'll get the functional groups. UV and visible light, um, not too useful from the organic chemist's point of view, in my opinion. So in my course, we won't be spending a lot of time on it, but very useful for determining the presence of pi systems. And, and of course, mass spectrometry, which is incredibly useful. And true mass spectrometrists will poo-poo even NMR and say, mass spec's the only thing you need. Um, we will uh, introduce you to mass spec and show you some of the basic methods of mass spec and tell you how to interpret some pretty simple fragmentation patterns. But again, mass spec deserves a course on its own, and NMR deserves a course on its own, and IR deserves a course on its own. They all deserve courses on their own, but uh, we're going to introduce you to all four of these techniques, and using the information from these, you will be able to determine the structure of small molecules. So that's spectroscopy. Now, let me introduce you to some of the details of the course. So uh, first of all, the instructor. My name is Barry Linkletter. Um, I had the wonderful opportunity to go to UPEI many years ago. Um, so I know this campus well. I went to McGill for my PhD. It's a, Montreal is a great city. I highly recommend if you have the opportunity to spend four years of graduate school, uh, Montreal is a great city to uh, go to. I uh, uh, worked at the University of California at Santa Barbara for a few years before coming here. Um, and Santa Barbara is a beautiful city and, again, uh, a great place to uh, spend some time. Although, when you're a postdoc, you don't generally get to see too much of what's outside your lab. Uh, I think I saw the beach 11 times, though, so I cherish those moments. Um, you can reach me. Uh, that's my phone number if you need to call me. And there's the, uh, my email address. Um, and, of course, you can contact me through the Moodle site. The textbook is called Introduction to Spectroscopy, um, and it's available in the bookstore. 
Um, and uh, the course is wrapped around it. You'll be asked to do problems out of it. So I suggest buying a copy or finding one used. There should be lots of used ones around. Um, there's a lot of elements in this course that I think can help you to succeed in this course. The lectures, if you come to the lectures, we're going to focus on problem solving in the lectures. Um, so I think they'll be really useful practice for you. So I highly recommend you come to all the lectures. Um, all the slides and handouts will be available on the Moodle site uh, after class, if not before, but I, I promise you that they will be there after class. I do not promise you that they will be there before class. Um, and of course, the Moodle site uh, is an opportunity for class participation. There's forums you can participate in, ask and answer questions of your fellow students, and assignments will be handed in through Moodle and graded, and your grades reported back to you through Moodle. So there's another great resource for helping you to succeed in this course. Um, there will be two class tests. The dates are in the syllabus, same for the final exam. Lab details are in the syllabus. Um, and on the first class, we'll be organizing um, lab partners. Um, and never forget that in every class, there may be an activity or some type of thing that's worth a small amount of marks. So there's lots of sort of free marks and easy marks that are available in this course. And any assignments, of course, you'll want to do. Some of them are voluntary, and some of them are for marks. But if you practice, 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 you'll do well on the tests. I promise you that. Um, there's a lab, and there's four lab sections, generally, uh, depending on the number of students. And so you'll se select one of those lab sections. Uh, all labs take place on Tuesday. Um, the labs alternate every second week. And so there's two sections take place on one Tuesday, and two sections take place on the next Tuesday. Um, when you're in the lab, you must wear safety glasses and a lab coat and proper footwear and all those other safety rules, and your lab instructor will tell you about that. And your lab instructor will inform you on what they want about lab reports. But basically, I guess the simplest thing is to say is hand them in on time. Um, on the right is basically an outline of the course. We'll start with the basics, um, you know, review Lewis structure and organic naming and things like that. Then we'll introduce infrared spectroscopy, its theory and application. Then we'll introduce you to NMR, um, some basic and intermediate NMR techniques. And then we'll segue over to mass spectrometry um, and, uh, and discuss how to interpret mass spectra data. And then we'll finish off the course with some advanced NMR topics, two-dimensional NMR and using pulse sequences in modern Fourier transform NMR uh, methods. Um, and uh, depending on time, at the end of the course, we may have presentations in which you present your interpretation of a data set. Um, so I hope you'll enjoy uh, the course, and I hope you'll enjoy uh, all these subjects. Um, once you finish with spectroscopy, you will be able to interpret spectra data that you see in the literature, and you'll be able to actually predict what the structure of a molecule is from spectra data that you might uh, get in, say, a lab like advanced organic chemistry. So these are the topics in more of uh, detail. And I'll not waste much more time on that since I've already gone through them. Next time I do this video, I'll remember that I had these close-ups. So that's the spectroscopy course. I hope you'll enjoy it, and I hope you'll have fun. Um, the easiest advice that I can give you to succeed in this course is to practice. Do, I will assign you problems from the textbook, but I advise that you do all the problems in the textbook. And then I advise that you go looking for problems to solve. The internet is full of other courses, um, other uh, spectroscopy websites, full of problems for you to solve. Find another book of uh, spectroscopy problems to solve. Go to Amazon.com and, and, and look up for spectroscopy uh, problem sets. Find problems and solve them. Go to the literature and just look up spectra and attempt to solve their structure. Uh, you cannot practice enough, but if you practice, you will find the tests very easy in this course, I promise you. Spectroscopy is a skill. The theory only gets you so far. Experience with interpreting the signs, much like a good hunter. Someone can tell you to look for um, footprints and bent grass blades. But unless you're an experienced hunter, you will never be able to track the ninja through the forest. And so you, how do you become that experienced hunter? Practice. And spectroscopy is the same thing. So please practice. So here's some, uh, uh, basically, the references from where I've stolen all my images online. Um, and uh, so you can, uh, if you're looking for where I got things, um, this is where they came from. Well, we'll see you in class.